Fire Emblem Three Houses has been an absolute smash hit in the community. Its sales have now exceeded such titans as Awakening and Fates, and it has brought a level of mainstream popularity to the franchise that many of us previously thought impossible. It has won multiple awards and have been frequently praised as one of the best Fire Emblem titles to come out in a very, very long time. There's plenty of things to praise it for, but that is not what we're going to be doing here on the channel today. Because regardless of how great a game is, there's always something to critique it for. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mengs, and in this video I'm going to be talking about all the things that Fire Emblem Three Houses did wrong. Now, since this is going to be a fairly negative piece of media, I'm going to balance it out with another video coming out tomorrow, where I'm going to be talking about everything Three Houses did right. So if you don't like people critiquing your favorite game, I suggest not watching this video and instead waiting for the one coming out tomorrow, as that one will be much more positive. Now, before I start criticizing, I want to remind everyone that I rank Tree Houses as my third most favorite Fire Emblem game in the series. And for the record, I played all 16 of them. That means I don't just like this game, I love this game. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable series that has provided me with hundreds of hours of entertainment, and surely many more to come in the future. Just because I'm making a video criticizing it doesn't mean I dislike the game. I personally find that critiquing things are a lot more interested in than praising them, and I think it's important that we take time to critique even our favorite games. Also, keep in mind that at the end of the day, all of this is just like my Your opinion, opinion, man. I'm just a guy on the internet. My thoughts aren't any more valuable than yours, and you're happy to disagree with me. If you are allergic to opinions, however, this is not the video for you. So let's begin and talk about everything Three Houses did wrong. <laughs> The game takes blatant shortcuts. For a game as packed with content as Tree Houses is, it's hard to critique it for being lazy. But once you rack up enough playtime, you start to notice certain patterns in this game that are hard to overlook. Every in-game cutscene is basically just a bunch of characters standing in a half circle with a generic backdrop. And whenever the characters have to perform an action that deviates from what their limited animations can pull off, a picture of whatever object they're interacting with is shown on screen instead. Certain characters are often brought up in the story, but are conveniently written in such a way that they don't appear, Hilda's big brother Holtz being the main offender, always being conveniently sick and out of action to avoid having his non-existent portrait or voice actor shown. These are only minor gripes, but they really add up, and for a game that's so rich in content, it sure feels like it's stretched very thin at times. And this brings me over to my next point, which is… The routes don't really feel all that different. While Three Houses is advertised as having three different paths, in actuality it has four, as picking the Black Eagles can make you split off into either the Edelgard route, aka Crimson Flower, or the Church route, aka Silver Snow. However, despite having four different routes, they don't really feel all that different from one another. Sure, the story changes slightly along with the playable cast of characters, and the endings are different for the most part, but after playing through three of the four routes, I was left with the feeling that I had simply replayed the same game three times with the different casts. Now, I will admit I'm less critical about this due to Three Houses not being sold as three separate games like Fates was, but the end result felt less like three houses and more like one house with three pretty similar rooms. However, one of these deserves an entire segment on its own, and that's what brings us over to the next thing Three Houses did wrong, which is... Edelgard's route is really bad. Now, if there's one suspicion I have regarding the development process of Tree Houses, it is that they bit over far more than they could chew. And it really shows, especially in regards to the Crimson Flower route. Mecha made a video titled Edelgard Deserved Better, where he picks apart the problems with this route, and I think it's one of the best ones he's ever made. So if you haven't seen that, you should definitely check it out. Link in the video description. Now, to briefly summarize his points, Edelgard was clearly marketed to us from the beginning as one of the most important characters in Tree Houses. She was in the center of most of the trailers we were shown, she was the only one out of the three lords to be voiced first, and her design really made her stick out. And yet, she was given the route which the developers put the least amount of effort into, a route that could be missed by a lot of players on their first playthrough. Now, don't get me wrong, I like Edelgard's role in Tree Houses. She's actually a pretty good villain, but her route is awful. It's way shorter compared to the other three, has practically no cinematics, and it feels really rushed. What I'm wondering is, why even have four routes? Why not just leave it at three? What's wrong with the Black Eagles being exclusively the Edelgard route? Why did we even need a church route at all? 
Now, I personally think there are two reasons why this route split was made. The first is that the Black Eagles are naturally the first house new players will pick, and the online statistics really support this. I think that the developers thought that the storyline where you betray the Garrick Mach Monastery and everyone in it might be a bit harsh for a first-timer, and so they made the church route as a bit of an easier alternative in case you still wanted to play with the Black Eagles without being the quote-unquote bad guy. I think the other reason is that they actually planned multiple route splits from the start, one for Asher Moon and one for Verdant Win. In Asher Moon, there is a ton of unused dialogue and battle quotes between the Blue Lion students that hints at a split within Dimitri's party, and there are also many dialogue choices given to the player over that route which seriously hints at branching paths, such as when Gilbert asks you if you want to move east or west, only to overrule your decision in the end because there was none to begin with. <sighs> I'll get more into that crap later. Anyway, I think that at some point, the developers realized that their ambitions far outreached their budget and time constraints, and after implementing the route split for the Black Eagles and somewhat starting on the Blue Lions one, they scrapped the idea altogether. But they kept the Black Eagles in since it was basically finished, and then they just left it at that. A half-assed fourth route left as some sort of easter egg for the player to find. Now, all of this is just speculation, of course, but in the end, I think having four routes instead of three actually made the game worse as a whole. I think it would have been far better if they took all the resources they spent on making the fourth routes and used them to just make a fully fleshed out, unique Edelgard route, worthy of standing on its own two feet. A route worthy of Edelgard and her fanbase, which, judging by the fourth True Shiro Legends popularity poll, is pretty massive. Anyway, that was a long rant. Let's move on to the next thing Treehouses did wrong, which is... The game tells instead of showing. This is not a problem exclusive to Treehouses or Fire Emblem in general. This is a common trope found in all forms of lazy storytelling. Simply choosing to explain something to the player is a lot easier and requires far less effort than making them feel or experience something on their own. After all, why go through the trouble of conveying thoughts and emotions to the players when someone can just show up and tell them what to think? Treehouses does this way too often for my liking. When I played Verdant Wind, I started calling Hilda the exposition hoe, because her job as Claude's retainer was so very often to show up and tell the players what had transpired. Sometimes this is warranted, like when she showed up to explain why her brother was sick, which she only read about in a letter. But other times it was downright inexcusable, such as when she appeared to explain to the player how Dimitri was killed off-screen. Yes, that's right, one of the three main characters of Treehouses killed off-screen, with Hilda having to narrate it. They couldn't even fucking bother to give us an in-game cutscene of him being surrounded before fading to black. Now, another example is how in the Crimson Flower route, Hubert shows up to tell you about how massive javelins of light came pouring down from the sky to level an entire city. Man, if only they had some sort of cinematic that showed this happening. I mean, yeah, I get it, it would have been a repeat from Verdant Wind, but it would have been a hell of a lot better than someone just talking about it. Now, what makes me angry about this is that I know that the writers of Treehouses are a talented bunch, because the story of this game can be fantastic at times. I've seen several scenes and cinematics where I've been made to feel a lot, so I know that they aren't incompetent compared to the Fates writers who just wrote a garbage story from start to finish, and that actually makes me more angry because I know they have no excuses for taking these kinds of shortcuts. And speaking of shortcuts, that brings me over to my next point, which is that... Maps are constantly recycled. By the time you finish your second or third playthrough of Tree Houses, it almost feels as if you've seen some of the maps at least 10 times, and I don't even think this is an exaggeration. The amount of map variety in Tree Houses is absolutely pathetic for such a huge game. It's not that the maps themselves are bad, like in Awakening. I'd say that in Tree Houses, the map design is alright for the most part, but even the most entertaining maps become boring the fifth time you see them, even if your starting location and enemy placement are a little bit different from time to time. The DLC waves promised new maps, but all we got was new auxiliary battles, and even those were just recycled maps from the other parts of the game, such as the tower map where you first fight Miklon. To my knowledge, we didn't get a single new original map via any of the DLC waves outside of the Cindered Shadows, and that's kind of a broken promise if you ask me. Hell, even Cindered Shadows blatantly reused maps for a lot of its stories, so I absolutely find this laughable considering we paid $25 for that shit. Now, my designer Cyan brought up a pretty good point, that the reason why the developers are so reluctant to make more maps is due to the zoom-in feature. 
Each map is required to have a lot of detail, which probably means they are quite time consuming to make. Either that or they just slashed the budget for map design heavily in favor of other things such as fully voiced supports and multiple routes. At any rate, I think map design is one of the most important aspects to a Fire Emblem game, and it's so sad to see so many games in the franchise neglecting this time and time again. Anyway, let's take a look at the next thing Treehouses did wrong, which is... Your choices don't matter. Just bringing up this line feels like I'm beating a dead horse. This is not something new to Tree Houses. In fact, this problem with modern Fire Emblem dates all the way back to Awakening. For example, anyone remember the heart-wrenching dilemma of whether or not to sacrifice Emerin, only for it to not matter at all because she decides to sacrifice herself anyway? Now, Treehouses likes to present you with choices. It does this a lot. In fact, the very first thing you see after starting up the game is Solthus asking you a question. A question that you seemingly have three answers to, giving you the illusion that you can impact the story in some way. But you quickly learn better, because aside from the occasional drop or rise in support points with the character you are interacting with, the amount of difference you make in the narrative of the game itself is non-existent. Well, aside from picking a house at the start of the game, that is. In fact, the only real time in the game where your choices actually have consequences is when you get the option to side with either Edelgard or Rhea in the Black Eagles routes. And the game makes sure you know this is an important choice, because it displays a heartbeat and unique graphics, and really making sure you know that this is a choice. And what I hate about this is that after seeing that rather intense graphic, you are now painfully aware that every other choice presented after this, not displaying such graphics, will probably not have any impact on the game at all. Because if it did, they would use those same graphics to emphasize it. And that really takes you out of the story in a massive way. My stance on the so-called illusion of choice will always be the same every time I encounter it, regardless of the game I'm playing. And that is, thanks. I hate it. If I don't have a say in what's going on, please don't insult my intelligence by pretending I do. If both my alternatives lead to the same outcome, just remove the alternatives altogether. You cannot continue to expect me to care about my choices in a video game when they don't matter 99% of the time. They just become buttons for me to click. They might as well be blank with no text on them. Alas, sadly this seems to be the only way treehouses can make Byleth seem important, because with a silent protagonist that is about as exciting as a block of wood, the game has to do something to pretend like you're important by giving you the illusion that you have a choice. And trust me, we'll get more into by left later. One of the biggest offenders to me regarding choices that don't matter happens during the Asher Moon route, where Gilbert asks Byleth on his input whether they should go east or west. When I encountered this choice initially, I was absolutely sure this was going to be a route split. They were in the middle of discussing what path to take, and when Gilbert asked the question, it seemed natural that it would have some sort of impact on the next map, and the alternatives presented made perfect sense. One was a lot more risky than the others, but saved time, while the other was safer but slower. It seemed to be a real strategic dilemma. The question was presented as a very important one, but as I learned, if you picked the incorrect answer, Gilbert basically just overrules you and tells you, nah, we go this other way instead. And you never get a chance to retort. Balath just stands there like the block of wood he is, silently accepting his fates. To my surprise, when I encountered the scene during my Let's Play, a bunch of people in my comment section feverishly defended it, by saying that Gilbert was just quizzing you on your knowledge of the landscape, he was never interested in your answer, he just wanted to see if you'd guess correctly. Man, I don't know why so many people defend choices that don't matter. It almost seemed as if they believe that if they can just disprove any criticism directed against it, they can fool themselves into believing that the choices are important. Because I don't really understand how anyone could defend this crap otherwise. Anyway, let's move over to the next point that don't matter, which is... The Avatar still sucks. Baleth is actually, in my humble opinion, one of the better avatars we've had in Fire Emblem. But at the same time, I also think he's awful and the tree houses would have been better off without him. And both of these statements can be true at once. It's just that all the other avatars in Fire Emblem have either been horrible or barely involved in the story at all. Baleth just happens to be the least awful of the bunch. But that isn't really to his credit, it just speaks volumes about how much the previous avatars sucked. The issue I have with Baleth is that he's just kind of weird and creepy. He takes me out of the story and he doesn't really add anything to it. And most of the time I feel like this game forgets he's 
even there, and then suddenly needs to find reasons to make him relevant. And then, of course, there's the Avatar worship. Not as much as Corrin got in Fates, and not as much as Chris jerks off Martha in FE12, but man, it's still there, and it gets a lot worse as the game progresses. You are the chosen one, you're special, everyone is drawn to you, Claude claims people almost worship you with their religious seal, Edelgard claims she could only possibly conquer the world without you by her side, Dimitri literally snaps out of depression because of you, and when you are gone for five years, sleeping in a chasm, or whatever it is that you do, the world seems to grind to a halt, as everyone just kinda stops what they're doing because they don't know how to progress a war without your support. In this story, you are the sacred MacGuffin, and everyone wants to get their hands on you, and honestly, I'm just kinda sick of it. For once, I would like to like the main character in a Fire Emblem game because of what he or she accomplishes during the main story, and actually feel a sense of attachment to said character because of the experiences I had as a player, not just because the game tells me the character is special. I think that Treehouses is a great game despite of Balath, not because of him. While I understand the need to have a player-controlled character that can interact with the world and how convenient that makes things, I think it's high time modern Fire Emblem stop relying on self-inserts to win people over. It's fan service and a bad form of it in my opinion, and I think it's personally just a very lazy way of telling a story. Self-inserts are easy. They're blank slates. They require zero imagination or effort to put into a story. They just need to nod and agree with everything that happens around them, and this is supposed to make you feel more connected to the world somehow. No, I say give us a proper main character that we can relate to and empathize with, and write him or her in such a way that makes us care about what's going on with them. Don't just give us a blank template and ask us to fill in your name and call it a day. You can do better than this. Stop this stupid trend of Avatar characters. They're dumb, uninspired, and unnecessary. Now, Speaking of dumb and unnecessary, let me talk about my next point, which is that supports feel repetitive. One major complaint I had about Echoes was that despite finally giving us voice supports, something we had been craving for years, there were just far too few of them, and they were way too short. Treehouses obviously saw this problem too and decided to go all in on it by cranking the support budget up to a hundred. There are so many supports in this game. It's honestly hard to grasp just how much voice acting had to go into all of this. While it is amazing that we finally got a game with a plethora of supports, kind of similar to Awakening and Fates, but with full voice acting to boot, I do wish that more creativity had gone into the writing of these. I realize that with so many supports, it is incredibly difficult to make each of them interesting and unique, but it really feels like you could have slashed most character supports in half, and it would still do nothing to affect their development, because there's so much repetition in these that it beggars belief. In the Fire Emblem community, we make a lot of fun of Awakening and Fates characters for being one-note and gimmicky, but Treehouses does this quite a bit too. Sure, there are excellent characters in there like Sethith, and even the most gimmicky characters like Bernadetta and Raphael have their fair share of great supports, but for every good one, there's at least five who feel like straight-up copypasta. Remember that one time Bernadetta was freaking out because she misinterpreted what a character was trying to tell her, then later managed to overcome her fair and discover that she and said character have a lot in common? Yeah, I just described like seven of her supports with one sentence. Granted, Bernadetta is probably one of the easiest characters to do this with, so let me do a few more just to make my point. Remember that one time Felix was training and then approached by another character, only to be very rude back because he thinks the character is a dumbass, only to gradually open up and become more friendly towards him? Or how about that one time Raphael was training and eating a lot and was being a jovial goofball trying to help out someone else in his supports but being kind of clumsy about it and maybe a little bit annoying to the other character? Or how about that one time Lorenz was being a dumbass noble talking down to someone else in a condescending way, only to suddenly show another side of himself that proves he's not as shallow as he first appeared? I could probably do this with the entire cast of Tree Houses, but I feel like I've made my point already. I feel like the support writers intentionally went for conversations that would invoke feelings rather than convey a story. There is so much more focus on silly events, embarrassing confrontations, and funny bloopers than anything else. But there are great ones hidden in there too. An example of a great support that may not be funny or entertaining, but still very interesting, is Caspar X. Petra, where they talk about how their fathers fought and how Casper's father killed Petra's father. Not only does this support convey powerful emotions and make you care about the characters, but it also teaches us about the history of the Dagda Bridget invasion, an extremely important event in Fodland's history that is the whole reason why Petra is even at the monastery to begin with. Now, I'm not saying every support needs to be like this. Variety is important after all, but I do wish that they cut down on the comical gags and delivered more actual exposition and backstory about the characters themselves. Another gripe I have with the supports is how quickly they 
they pile up on you at once. After clearing a map, it's not unusual to go into exploration mode only to see that around 10 new support conversations have been unlocked, and that's just too many. In the previous Fire Emblem games, supports would often be unlocked one at a time, and seeing one being available felt great, but Treehouse's supports more often than not feel like chores to go through, and that's a damn shame, because supports is to me one of the most entertaining and interesting aspects of Fire Emblem. They're a great way to flesh out characters and the world, but I feel like in Treehouses, they're just there to sort of give you a laugh. Anyway, moving on to my next point, which is... Geralt was poorly handled. I imagine that writing the character of Geralt was a huge challenge right from the start. Dads in Fire Emblem have a pretty bad track record when it comes to staying alive, and everyone knew that he was going to kick the bucket at some point during the story. The question wasn't really if Geralt was going to die, it was when he was going to die. My complaints about Geralt isn't really regarding the way he died though, but more the way he was handled as a character in the game itself, both as a gameplay unit and a story element. I'll start by talking about my issues with him in the story first. Now, I'll give Geralt credit where credit is due, his design is stellar, and his voice actor is on point. I love how he narrates the intro segments of the game, it really makes them a lot more enjoyable. It's quite obvious that the writers of Treehouses took a lot of inspiration from Path of Radiance's Grail, though I don't really think they managed to capture the same kind of father-child relationship that Grail had with Ike. In Path of Radiance, the first scene you witness is Ike and Grail training together. You see Grail being a stern but loving father, and when he is eventually killed in the story, it is a pretty emotional scene. With Geralt and Byleth, however, you don't really get all that many bonding moments. They have some interactions with each other, and Geralt is one of the first characters you talk to aside from Sothis, but as a person, Geralt feels kind of distant and cold throughout the entire story. I know he is very much written to behave this way, often being described by others as caring about you a lot, but not really showing it directly. This is all well and good if you don't want Byleth and Geralt's relationship to be in focus, but you can't really then expect me to feel a lot when you depict Byleth crying over their dad's dead body in the rain. It's obvious they were trying to heavily borrow from the scene where I carries his father on his shoulder, also through the rain, but by comparison, the Byleth scene just feels kinda hollow, since you as a player haven't really been given many reasons to care about their relationship, aside from the fact that he's your father and you should be sad that he's dead. My second gripe with Geralt is how he is handled in the game itself. In the prologue, he's a green unit, acting as your basic tutorial. He even helps you out a little bit if the bandits overwhelm you. After that though, he kinda just goes away, fading into the background as a side character, leaving you to do most missions on your own. He shows up once during the mission in Remire, and then once more in the chapter right before he is killed. I also think that not making Geralt playable was a poor decision. One of the main complaints I have regarding Treehouse's early game is a lack of a Jagan type character, aka a strong pre-promoted unit with solid bases but poor growth rates. This makes the maddening early game in particular quite a slog. Having Geralt be playable for a few of the early missions would go a long way towards fixing this, and would also, in my opinion, make his death a little bit more impactful. You tend to care a lot more about characters if you actually get to play with them a little. I was equally annoyed with Cindered Shadows not capitalizing on the grand opportunity of making him playable, since that side story even takes place before his death in the story, and was heavily centered on his wife to boot. But hey, complaining about the DLC is something I'll get to later. I'll round off this segment by simply saying that Geralt could have been handled a lot better. He had tons of potential, but sadly he will go into the history books as yet another Fire Emblem dad gone wrong. It's a bit of a shame if you ask me. The cinematics look... choppy. Recently going back to play Awakening again has made me appreciate just how gorgeous the cinematics of that game looked, despite being 8 years old. Hell, the cinematics of Radiant Dawn still look pretty good today, and yet for some reason Treehouses insists on these weird anime-style cutscenes in 15 FPS that just looks clunky and weird. I mean, I want you to look at this gorgeous exchange of swordplay between Krom and Lucina from Awakening. And then I want you to look at this. What the hell is this? What is Claude even doing here? This does not look good. I think it's high time we get a proper Fire Emblem game with proper cutscenes that actually look like people are fighting properly. Some paralogues are really bad. Treehouses is filled with paralogues, and I really like how they unlock based on certain combinations of students being recruited into your house. It rewards you for going out of your way to get as many students as possible, and it makes each playthrough different. The paralogues themselves usually also have some interesting gimmicks to them. Very rarely are they simple route or boss kill maps, but often they require you to save civilians, capture points, or otherwise go out of your way to achieve a specific objective. And all that is great. 
What I really dislike about a lot of the paralogues is how they're written. Now I get it, paralogue means side story, and by definition the writers have to be careful to write them in such a way that the player won't miss out on anything super important in case they're skipped, while also making them feel meaningful to play, which is a tricky combo, I know. However, many of the paralogues in Treehouses just feel odd, as if very little thought was put into them. Petra's paralogue comes to mind here, where it's stated that she's going to travel to Bridget to see her grandfather, which initially excited me a lot. However, what I got was a recycled map filled with generic enemies, ending in Petra visiting her homeland off-screen, with a fade to black, only to come back again and say, yeah, that was nice. First of all, I thought the whole thing about Bridget was that it was supposed to be very far away. Petra longingly talks about how much she misses her homeland in her supports, and yet in her paralogue, her visit to Bridget is treated like a leisurely stroll down to the neighborhood block. If Petra's paralogue was the only offender like this, I wouldn't have had a huge problem with it. But I find that many of the Treehouse's paralogues follow the same pattern of odd and just lazy writing. Ingeni and Dorothea randomly traveling through lava to see a suitor. The Casper x Mercedes paralogue, where Casper just kinda comes along for the ride, even though he's not really connected to the Death Knight in any way at all. Rhea's paralogue, where the entire monastery basement is suddenly filled with phantom soldiers. Don't get me wrong, many of these paralogues are kinda cool. Epic, even. But the story surrounding them is just incredibly strange at times, and very seldom does clearing one actually reveal something worthwhile to the player. There are exceptions, of course, but I feel like most of these paralogues should have been used to expand the knowledge of the characters in question, teaching us about a part of their backstory that we previously weren't aware of, or anything like that. But it feels like Treehouses just wants to leave this particular job to the supports, making many of the paralogues feel empty, hollow, and unnecessary. The Monastery quickly becomes a chore. The Monastery is a big aspect of Treehouses, and at least early on it's an enjoyable one. It offers a nice reprieve in between battles and allows you some time to breathe before heading off into the next one. The music and atmosphere inside the Monastery is chill, and going into exploration mode often feels like coming home after a hard day of work. It allows you a nice chance to chat with the students, and most of the activities you perform there are pretty enjoyable. At least, to begin with. It may vary a bit from player to player, but to me, it didn't take long before the monastery lost its charm. Rather than something I looked forward to, it became tedious and time-consuming. Sure, in the beginning your activity points are limited and there's not that many places you can go, but towards the endgame you find yourself doing the same things over and over and over. You start by visiting the greenhouse to collect materials and to plant seeds, before you move on to the dining hall and feed your students until they're high on motivation, maybe you'll do a quick cooking session for a food buff, and then some choir practice if you want, and then it's pretty much just spamming into the arena to get gold or maybe the sauna if you bought the DLC. And don't get me started on the fishing. Due to the way you tend to accumulate bait as you save them up for specific weeks when you'll get more out of it, you tend to have to do these hour-long fishing sessions if you want to play optimally, which is not fun. Now, you can, of course, ignore exploration and instead opt to either attend a seminar or simply rest, but the problem I have with these two options is that they're both suboptimal. Resting is just bad, it restores only 50 motivation to your students and repairs your Sword of the Creator by a measly 5 points. Hardly worth it considering everything else you're losing out on. Seminars can be more useful, but they're a big hassle to optimize, forcing you to go and reassign your students' goals in order to get them to attend the one you want, which most players just straight up won't bother doing. In most cases, it's nearly always better to explore than to do something else. You could do auxiliary battles, of course, and some paralogues, if you have them unlocked, but unless you're crazy, there's no way you're gonna do three auxiliary battles for the four weeks you have to fill before the next map. Overall, I actually think the monastery is fine in theory, it just becomes too bloated towards the end. Simply scaling down the amount of activity points you get throughout the game would have gone a long way towards fixing this, or at the very least making it more lucrative to attend the odd seminar, or simply to rests. Certain gameplay elements are hidden. Three Houses is one of the most complicated Fire Emblem games we've gotten to date. The amount of customization and choice you have in regards to how you build your students is off the charts, and yet many of these gameplay mechanics are hidden from the player and never properly explained. There are countless examples of this, such as how Quick Reposts has a wary fighter skill built into it, how Magic ignores terrain effects and has its avoid affected by luck despite never being explained to work this way, how Life Taker actually restores health based on the total damage you do in a round, and not just the killing blow, how Battalion Endurance can never be reduced by more than one third of its total health in one hit, or how even Gambit damage and hit slash avoid is calculated. And then there's things like how Agitons work. 
Seriously, did you know how to properly utilize Argetons until you looked it up online? On one hand, this stuff is great for YouTubers like Chase Aria LLC and sites like Serenus Forests who can put out informative guides that greatly help the player base and garner lots of views in the process. And part of me actually wonders if the developers intentionally left some mechanics of treehouses unexplained so that the player base could have more fun experimenting and discovering things on their own. But the more rational part of my brain think that they just forgot to include a lot of these hidden mechanics in the game's tutorial because the game is so massive and so complex that they simply ended up forgetting to explain a lot of their own mechanics. Balance is completely thrown out the window. I already knew from the moment I discovered the stride gambit that balance was not going to be something Treehouses was going to take very seriously. But I didn't understand how much you could truly break this game until I co-hosted an episode of Rengor's maddening 0% growth run. Seeing him effortlessly playing through chapters I had previously struggled on, like they were nothing special at all, just because the builds he used on his characters allowed him to massacre maddening mode enemies like they were nothing, truly made me realize a thing or two about the state of this game and its balance. Even if you don't go out of your way to exploit mechanics such as Battalion Wrath plus Vantage, or go for builds which allows a character to get 100% crit, the amount of tools you are given as a player to combat the challenges ahead is absolutely ludicrous. Many would probably think this to be a good thing, and in some aspects I do agree. Treehouses is a sandbox game, and you're meant to play around with it and have fun. But certain elements of this game feel so blatantly unbalanced that I question whether they were playtested at all. Who on earth thought that giving flyers super canto and allowing them to move the same turn they mount or dismount, completely negating their flyer vulnerabilities, was a good idea? And why on earth did the developers go so hard out of their way to nerf cavalry when flying units are so strong by comparison? Balance in Fire Emblem is a very tricky subject. Since it's not a competitive multiplayer game, things being broken doesn't really have a huge impact on player satisfaction. Quite the opposite. Breaking the game is fun, and certain overpowered characters and skill combinations can cement them as fan favorites in the community. Hell, I've made the point that I like Binding Blade because the power difference between the playable characters is so noticeable. Also, it's not like Treehouses is the only Fire Emblem game that can be broken. Just head over to Don Don's channel and you can see it done to practically every game in the series. But I do still wish that in some aspects the developers of Treehouses could have held themselves a little more in check, because when it's so easy to break the game, it kind of loses its charm. The time skip is poorly implemented. I really love the idea of a time skip in a Fire Emblem game. It creates a lot of excitement as you get to watch the characters grow older, and it allows the story some time to evolve. What I don't like, however, is the way it was implemented in Tree Houses. It's so weird that by let just pulls down a chasm, only to magically reappear five years later because of reasons. It's never properly explained exactly how he pulls it off, it just happens because he has funky Sophist powers. Furthermore, because very little actual time passes for the player playing the game, meeting your students again just mere minutes after you left them doesn't exactly give you a lot of time to miss them. I think that there should have been at least a map in between the time skips to give the player a bit of a buffer, and I secretly hope this is what the Abyss would be, a story that takes place after Baleth falls down into the canyon. I mean, it would have been a perfect setup, as that's exactly what happens. He literally falls into a dark abyss. Another great disappointment to me was how after the time skip, nothing really changes at the monastery. You're still running around doing the same activities you were five years prior. The students still call you professor, and even though the tutoring looks different, in essence you're still doing exactly the same thing. Hell, even the seeds I planted five years earlier are still there, ready to be picked. A small detail I know, but still points out how little attention they gave to the time skip itself. The fact that you also always return back to the monastery also makes the second phase of the game feel really strange. In the first phase, it makes sense that you return back to the academy after a mission, because you're all students at the school and it's kinda your hub. But in the second phase, depending on what route you pick, you're usually off somewhere completely different, fighting a war in the various nations. When Dimitri is giving a grand speech about how it's time to march onto the capital and defeat Edelgard, it really takes you out of the narrative when all of you have to walk all the way back to the monastery for four weeks before continuing the attack. It also makes no sense from a logistical standpoint. Based on the news articles I was reading about the game at the time before it came out, I was always under the impression that the war phase of the game would be radically different from the school phase, not taking place at the monastery at all, but instead having a mobile camp that moved all over Fodlan. Kind of similar to how the base changes in Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, depending on where you are in the story. I understand they put a lot of effort into the monastery, and I'm not saying we had to ditch it completely post-time skip. There could still be events, even maps that transpire up at Garak Mach, 
but to me, just repeating the same thing you did over again in the pre-time skip phase feels very lazy and uninspired, and it certainly doesn't make the monastery any less of a chore. Divine Pulse has way too many charges. The amount of arguing the community has had over the turnwheel mechanic has been pretty insane ever since its introduction in Shadows of Valentia. There's the group of people who claims it ruins the franchise, and then there's the people who say, well, just don't use it if you don't like it. Personally, I'm of the mindset that the turnwheel is a good mechanic, and as a Let's Player, I love it solely due to the amount of time it saves me when making videos. I just think you get way too many charges of it. I'm not exactly sure how many you can get over the course of a game in total, but I've had as many as 12 in my playthroughs, and that is absolutely absurd. Now, I did encounter several maps on Maddening Mode where I actually ran out of charges, but that is mostly due to my own incompetence and the fact that Maddening Mode has very unfair ambush spawns that you can't really predict unless you know they're coming. Personally, I think capping out the pulses at 3 or 4 would have been much more fitting. You could start out with a single charge, then get one more from the Sothis Paralog, and then a third after merging with her in the story, and maybe then you could unlock one more with Renown or something. Anything beyond that is just excessive in my opinion. Hard mode is too easy. Maddening mode is too difficult. I am actually one of the few players that really enjoyed maddening mode and its difficulties, though I think playing the game alongside with a guy who specializes in making guides in Chaz made the experience considerably smoother and more fun for me. Still, I actually really welcome most of the challenges Maddening Mode brought to my doorstep, with the exception of maybe the ambush bonds. Still, I find the difficulty jump from hard to maddening to be absolutely extreme. It's kind of similar to Awakening, where hard mode is a little too easy, but lunatic mode is way too hard. I think that there definitely should have been another difficulty in between the two, because if I ever want to replay Tree Houses, I definitely would consider hard mode too much of a snooze fest, while I would consider maddening mode too much of a hassle, and that's not great in my opinion. Maddening Mode feels untested. Speaking of Maddening Mode, the fact that it was not part of the game at launch really makes me think it was a last minute addition that was given very little time and resources to develop. They clearly realized that two difficulties would not satisfy the player base, and don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful that they released it as part of free DLC rather than not at all. However, even though I personally enjoyed Maddening Mode and its challenges, there are aspects of it that just seems blatantly untested. The early game is ridiculously overtuned, and you have to chip down enemies using bow wielding students as they get one round by generic enemies otherwise. Simply choosing to make all reinforcements in the game ambush bonds is also horrendously lazy, because a lot of the reinforcements that show up on certain maps are not meant to work that way. I understand they most likely did this to eat through your divine pulse charges, but still, it's lazy design and I don't like it. The DLC kinda sucks. I want to wrap up this video by talking a little bit about the DLC. I know it's not part of the main game, but it's still something that's important to a lot of people. Now, I did an entire review on Cindered Shadows in a different video, so I won't repeat myself too much here, but overall, I am not very satisfied with the content we got. Most of it was just cosmetic outfits, which doesn't really bring a whole lot of value to the game, and things such as the sauna weren't exactly exciting additions. The four new students were great, but Cindered Shadows had a bunch of issues on its own, such as a horrendously bad story, and the inability to just buy it separately on its own without getting all the extra crap on top of it. Still, the fourth DLC wave definitely gave us a lot of content, but the three waves prior to that really sucked in my opinion. But hey, there's actually rumors of a fifth or sixth wave possibly coming in the future, so maybe I'll have to eat those words at some point. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. A very lengthy video of me tearing tree houses a new one. However, if you now hate me and want to dislike this video and unsubscribe, you'll be happy to learn that tomorrow there will be a video where I will be doing exactly the opposite. So before you write me any death threats in the comment section, I'll hold off and just watch that video first, because I do have a lot of good things to say about this game too. Again, just because I criticize something doesn't mean I dislike it. Quite the opposite. I criticize things I care about, and Tree Houses is and will probably always be one of my favorite Fire Emblem games in the series, despite everything that it did wrong. So this is where I want to hear your opinion. If you liked this video, feel free to leave a like, and if you hated it, feel free to leave a dislike. Do you agree or disagree with any of my points above? Maybe you feel like I missed something? Whatever it is, please canto down to the comment section and let me know what's on your mind. And remember, if nothing else, you can always say the crests are to blame.
Now before I sign off, I'd like to give some praise to my wonderful and talented script readers who combed through this incredibly long and tedious script to provide feedback, thoughts, and suggestions. I really appreciate you guys helping me out. I also want to give a quick shout out to my wonderful Patreon supporters who keep supporting my channel month after month. Anyway guys, if you think I was being overly cruel to Treehouses in this video, just know that there will be a very positive video coming out tomorrow to balance it out. My name has been Mengs, thank you for watching, and goodbye.